Hello. Today's going to be a fun video, especially if you made it through last week's video about pre-production. Let me tell you that this episode hopefully will be a little bit more entertaining. You were probably expecting from last week's video that we would be jumping into instruments and recording audio. It's going to be a lot of episodes to this one song. And the reason I'm doing that, the reason there's going to be so many long drawn out videos, there's so many steps involved in creating a song and making this music that we're making. We've not figured out the perfect way to do things, but this is kind of what's been working for us lately. And I want you to be able to see and know every step along the way. So some songs will go a little bit faster, some will go a little bit slower, but today we're gonna to be talking about the piano. Uh, what I was just playing for you was our Casio keyboard. Now in last week's video, I made the mistake of thinking that what was on the recording was a piano at my parents' house or a piano at my dad's church. It was in fact this piano, this keyboard right here. So I apologize for that. Before we get digging into this piano video, please hit subscribe. If you are actually watching this video and should you even dare to make it all the way to the end, leave me a comment. Just say, you know what? I made it to the end. I would appreciate that so much. There's some links on my channel as well for a Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, however you want to stay up to date. I'll be posting to those things regularly. And we'll also have a 30 second video that will come out on Thursdays, to kind of give you a preview of our Friday's video. So today it's all about recording and listening to the files that I've got for the song Sunday afternoon as I recorded the piano at Bethel Baptist Church. Thanks. All right, so here we go. This is all about the piano for the song Sunday Afternoon. Now, I've prepared a video that basically while I was at the church, I brought my iPhone with me on a tripod and I set it up so that I could capture some of the video since it was not in this room that we recorded. It was over at the church. I didn't do any talking while I was recording the piano. Honestly, I was just worried about do I have enough time to make this thing work? And there was something kind of silly that happened <laughs> all throughout the process of recording this piano that I want you to hear and it'll hopefully frustrate you just as much as it was frustrating to me at the time but uh, let's start at the beginning of this video here now this is the sanctuary to the church it's pretty large and as you can see I'm, I believe I'm going to be walking up to the piano I want you to see the size of this room mainly because you are going to hear that in the recordings no matter where I put this microphone Unless I put a bunch of pillows around it and stuffed it in a corner somewhere, I'm not going to be able to avoid the largeness of this room. That to me is a benefit because as you can see in this room here, if I play that same piano in this room, it will sound different. It won't have that natural reverb and the ambience that you get from such a large sanctuary. So. Right now, I've basically brought all my stuff in from the car. This is how I walked up to the piano at the church. And essentially I'm going to be setting up, I brought my own mic stand, so I don't want to use any of the church's stuff unless I absolutely have to, but these are good mic stands that I've got. They're going to be holding up a pair of SM81 microphones. These are small diaphragm condenser mics. Right now I'm essentially running a power strip. So you always need power. Uh, I'm going to be using my laptop for recording. This is a MacBook and basically my laptop is gonna be plugged into my audio interface. You should see that in just a little bit. The audio interface that I have here on my desk is the same one. It's the Apollo Twin, and it gives me two microphone preamps. I can plug any two microphones into this device, and that device then plugs in through a Thunderbolt cable. It goes into my laptop. Basically translates acoustic sounds from a microphone translates that into a bunch of ones and zeros that my computer can then play back. It's called an interface because it's helping the computer speak with microphones and instruments and things like that. Okay, so here I've got my interface and its little case. And uh, there next to the laptop is my 
SSD, it's a portable SSD that's actually got the song files on it. That way I don't have to lug my desktop computer around with me. I can just put the files that I need on that SSD, plug that into my computer, plug the interface into the computer, and then I can sit at the piano and I can play. One thing that happened, I haven't used this Apollo in such a long time with this laptop that there had to first be an update. If my desktop is up to date, but my laptop isn't, the laptop has to update. So unfortunately there was a good 18 to 20 minutes of waiting on that. So I'm gonna skip ahead. That's a headphone extension cable I've got plugged in. So I don't have to worry about being super close to my laptop. I can kind of walk around if I need to. There you can see I've got the microphone and I'm about to open up this upright piano. So I was assuming that this upright piano kind of figuring out as I'm going, but most uprights I'm used to, the top section of the upright would just open up like a flap. This one was almost like the hood of a car. Pretty neat. I'm looking for it right now, but there's a little kickstand that's going to keep the lid open for me. And the reason I'm opening it up is because wherever the contact is, just like if I was recording a drum set or an acoustic guitar, I want to make sure I got the microphones the first thing I want to try is get the microphones as close to where contact is happening. And on these pianos, the hammers that are hitting the strings, just like if I were recording an acoustic guitar um, and my fingers are hitting the strings, I want to be able to get the microphones close to where the contact is happening. I've got the SM81s on this. Uh, it's a special configuration here. and I've, You're going to see there's some painter's tape on there. But basically, I've got the two microphones doing this number, kind of overlapping uh, where the tip of the microphones are. One basically pointed this way, the other one pointed this way. And the reason I'm using this XY pattern is because I don't have to worry about any sort of phasing issues. If I put a microphone in front of my face and then I set a microphone six feet away, and I record both of those microphones at the same time, there's going to be a delay for one microphone and it's going to make my voice sound like it's going to make it sound like my voice is in two places at once, very unnatural sounding. So in order to get those microphones in phase, you either have to do a bunch of math and use rulers and measurements. I'm not very good at that stuff as I've found out. So that's why I learned the X, Y pattern. Okay. With XY, I can essentially use this contraption to keep my microphones right on top of each other, pointed at this kind of 90 degree angle thing. I believe it's 90 degrees. But I can keep them together and then move the pair of the microphones anywhere I need them to be. And in this case, I'm at the piano. This song is in the key of C, so I'll, you'll notice I'll do this, basically find where my fingers are gonna be a majority of the time. And then I'm going to find that C and I'm going to set the microphones just above where that note is. Reason is majority of the time I'm using the bottom three fourths of the piano. I will rarely go to the upper octaves. What that means is if, if there's going to be, if I'm essentially down here at these octaves, I don't want to put the microphone somewhere that I'm not actually going to be making use of the keys. I'll get a whole lot better sound, a more direct sound, if I make the center of the piano the actual center of my playing. I'm not just going to the piano and saying this is a four foot piano. I'm gonna put it at the two I'm gonna put it at the two foot mark. I'm looking at it as okay if my lowest note I'm hitting is this C and then at one point the highest notes I'm playing are up here. This range is the range that I'm wanting to record. I don't need to record that C. That C is not going to be played in the song. So with looking at those octaves, I'm going to try and get the microphones the middle of my playing range, not the middle of the piano. I hope that's translating. Okay. What you're going to notice now is my struggles because of the angle of the upright piano, I can't get the angle of my microphone stand to be parallel. And the problem with that is that if my microphones are closer to some of the hammers than the other hammers, 
it's going to make certain notes sound a lot louder than the other ones. It's going to offset. So basically, my you can see <laughs> hands on the hips there. I am trying to think, what can I do to move? I have two options. I can either move the upright piano. And what I figured out, because it takes me a while, is I figured out, you know what? Instead of trying to move the piano, why don't I just move the microphone stands to the other side? Okay, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. But now I've got the microphone stand on the left side, and by being on the left side, I've got a whole lot more space to maneuver, and I can really get parallel with the strings and with the hammers. This is me figuring out where the center of my playing is. So I'm looking at the microphones, and at this point, it's kind of a guess game. I haven't recorded anything yet. I haven't put my headphones on, so I don't know what the microphones are hearing. I'm just hoping that what they're hearing is really good. What I'm plugging into is a headphone extension cable that's like a 15 foot cord. And that's just so I don't have to worry about stretching these things out. But running down my shirt, I've got these in-ears. Okay, these in-ears are gonna, they're in-ear monitors. So anything that's coming through the headphones, I don't have to worry as much about that getting into the microphones. I really don't want the sound that I'm hearing in here, the click track, whatever it is. I don't want the microphones picking that up. So I put these on, and then what I also do, kind of as an added step, an added layer, is I'll put these gun mufflers on top of my um, in-ears, okay? It looks really goofy, but what I really like about it is that by putting so many layers over my ears, it takes out the sound of the piano in the room, and I can really focus in on I'm hearing exactly what the microphones are hearing. So as far as movement and where the microphones have to be, I'm not hearing it in the room thinking, oh, that sounds really good, so that I then come back here, find out it doesn't sound good. I can pretty well expect that what I'm hearing as I'm playing is what I'm gonna be hearing here in the room. So I'm putting the headphones in. There we go. So the big green <laughs> gun mufflers. All right, again, it looks super dorky. But anyway, uh, it's giving me so much protection from hearing all the outside sounds that as I hit the piano keys, I can hear what I need to hear, okay? All right, now you can really see, hopefully you can see this, but now you can see the SM81s set up on the piano, okay? So here's this XY pattern I was talking about. You see the these are the tips of the microphones. If these were microphones that you were holding or ones like this where I'm talking into, uh, this part here where my mouse is, that's the part that's picking up the sound, okay? So you plug these in from the back. These have to have phantom power. But you can see this little XY configuration. This microphone right here is pointed at the higher registers. This microphone here is kind of pointed at the medium and low. If I take these microphones and just slide them on the X axis more to the left, what I'll do is I'll get a more beefy low end sound. If it's a little too much, if it's kind of muddy, I can slide this more to the right. I don't believe I had to do a lot of shifting. I like the sound that I was getting. All right, and as I hit that middle octave, you can see that's pretty much where I put the two microphones. That's where they're overlapping. All right, and that is my computer updating its software to the latest version where it, unfortunately it said 18 minutes, but I used that time to practice. Okay, these are the gum mufflers. Now, I believe I've got some sound coming up soon so you can hear what the iPhone is hearing. We'll get to the recording, what Studio One was hearing in just a second, but that's the headphone extension cable. All right. Now what I'm doing, you probably heard me testing as well. I've got Studio One open now and basically on my interface, there's a big knob in the middle. I'm setting the level, the gain level for the microphones. So basically the more you turn up the gain on the microphones, the more sensitivity the microphones are gonna have to sound. So if I'm hitting the keys, kind of a average, medium, this is about, it's about as heavy as I'm gonna hit. I'll go ahead and set the gain to make sure I'm getting good levels on the interface. And usually I'm shooting for about negative 18 on the interface. That's 
negative 18 decibels that's pretty common it means i've got 18 decibels of headroom so that if i for some reason if i slam on the keys i've got 18 decibels of headroom to work with without overloading the preamps okay so essentially just hitting through those Now, I've gone through and I'll show you the audio files in just a second, but one of the things I didn't capture on video was I went through the progression that you've heard on the intro of this song and the Apollo interface has a neat function where it basically emulates hardware preamps from many decades ago, okay? These are preamps that would cost, normally cost a lot of money. This stuff has been able to emulate that hardware as close as possible. So the first thing I wanted to do, since this has been a long time since I've tried this, I basically did a shootout, the same microphones in the same position. I did a shootout to compare all the different preamps that I have at the moment. And you'll hear those in just a little bit, but essentially I settled on the, the 10, Neve 1084 preamp and I like the sound of that. And I think you'll hear it as well. Again, you're hearing the sound from the iPhone. This is not the microphones yet. Still good. Okay. Now, one of the parts I had to practice over and over again were these chord shapes I go into, which I mentioned last week with the pre-production video. I can, I basically practice this whole thing. I practiced that thing enough that I've gotten pretty comfortable with it. But what kept changing every time I played this song was what chords, what inversions of the chords I was going to play when I got to verse one. So you'll hear me kind of practicing and messing up with that. So I didn't like that octave as much. I was trying to add the bass notes as well. Kind of experimenting with the sounds at this moment to see what I was going to like. What you can really hear, um, even just with the iPhone, micro the iPhone's microphone, you really hear the ambience of this upright piano, and that's just because one, I've got the lid open to the upright, but also the sound from the piano is able to fly out in all directions to the room. All right, last thing I want to show you, we're not going to sit through all of the takes and stuff, but I want you to listen to something that I was mentioning earlier that was pretty funny. So check this out. Okay, so uh, that was the sound of lawn care maintenance. So I basically, this whole thing could have taken an hour and I was into, <laughs> I ended up being there for three to four hours and that's because I, evidently I went on the one day that they were going to be trimming the hedges, using the leaf blowers, using the lawn mowers, but uh, this was pretty consistent. So what I would do is I basically just use the time to practice. So if I heard a lawnmower in the recording, I basically needed to start over and do it again. And I want you to hear that because you'd think that in the sanctuary with these microphones pointed at the piano, surely the lawnmower is not going to be loud enough for it to pick that up, but it definitely was. So let's take a listen to this. I'll try not to blast your ears out, but take a listen and let's listen to some leaf blowers.
may seem like it's a small deal, not that big of a deal at all, but I know no matter how no matter how loud I play the piano to try to overwhelm the sound of the leaf blower, it's always going to be layered in the sound. So the moment I start mixing this piano, if I put compression on it, if I start to turn up the levels, if I start EQing, everything I do with this piano sound is going to have that leaf blower layered with it. That's why when we record here, we turn off the air conditioner. It's bad enough when a car drives by, you'll hear that as well. These microphones are very sensitive for a good reason. We want the microphones to be sensitive. We want them to pick up all the details. Anyway, had to work around that. We'll see if there's anything else on this video. And that's me getting, <laughs> and that's me getting up and saying, okay, I'm going to go ahead and eat my peanut butter and jelly. I basically was hoping that they were going to take a lunch break at some point, but that didn't seem to happen. So, all right, now we are in studio one. You remember last week I went through the arrangement view so you can see all the colors are still there. We've got our scratch mix at the top. Basically that's the old recording from five or six years ago. Here we've got the virtual pianos. Okay. On these, uh, pink tracks. I've tried to color code these, so hopefully it won't be as confusing. So this white track at the top, that's the original mix. We don't need to reference that right now. And then, uh, here's the virtual piano tracks. We don't need those at the moment. Now here's, uh, we've got Lana's scratch vocal in this blue, light blue color here in purple. These are the recordings that I had from the session at Bethel. Okay. So this one that says RP just made that real piano 1084 best take. Now, if I right click this and I say expand layers, these other four takes under here, these layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, I got to the point where I thought, they were kind of stopping the leaf blower enough that the moment I heard the leaf blower stop, I would just hit record and try to go as far as I can in the song. And for the first three takes, basically I, I would play it. I would get to a point where I either messed up or I started hearing a leaf blower and then I would just stop the recording. You think it's complete silence. I was even playing it and I thought, wow, that sounded really good. And then as soon as I stopped playing the piano, I started thinking, wait, I'm hearing a leaf blower. And sure enough, I took my headphones off and all right. So that's a bummer. But first thing I did, uh, down here in these tracks, see these very short phrases. What I did was I tried out the different preamps. Now, if I go to the Apollo's software, it's right here. Basically what I can do, I can go to insert a preamp. Okay. So this is their emulation of a Neve 1073. Okay. Companies make hardware versions of these preamps that like BAE makes one that I believe is like $3,000. This one came with my interface. So it saves some money to go software, but this stuff really does a good job to emulate. I don't have the ear and may not ever have the ear to know exactly what a Neve 1073 is supposed to sound like, but this one sounded pretty good. Okay. The other ones I tried out, uh, ended up going with the Neve 1084, which is not that. Neve 1084, it looks very similar to the 1073. It is very similar. It's got few different bells and whistles as far as the frequencies that you can change with the EQ. I believe on every one of the preamp emulations I tried, I did engage the EQ, even though I didn't adjust any EQ on the way in. Okay. I don't like doing a whole lot of correction and stuff while I'm recording. I'm going to save that for when I'm actually mixing. Okay. All right. The other one I tried was just the default built in the Apollo preamp. You just plug in, don't, I didn't load any plugins to it. That was an option. And the other one was 
the Universal Audio 610B. This one is emulating a tube preamp, and you'll be able to hear that as well. All right, so here are those recordings. So I've named this one the Real Apollo Pre. That means basically you plug it straight into the Apollo, not loading any software, just listening to it, and this is what it sounded like. Here's the stuff so again it wasn't a drastic change between any of these preamps every single one of them would have done the job what had a bigger factor was actually the differences between the takes so each one of these recordings was a different time that I was playing the keys what I'm going for with this song is to avoid anything that's going to quantize the tracks quantization on studio one is the process where if I'm playing the piano and let's say I'm playing these notes here okay quantization will take those notes those individual notes that I'm playing and it will snap them to a grid now you, it's basically the auto tuning of instruments the virtual piano you're listening to in last week's video had quantization on it I'm gonna try to emulate the differences of what I'm thinking of as quantization and something that's a little more freer. Okay, now here's one where I still want to try and be on the beat but I kind of want to have a little relaxed every now and then, a little more musical. Some of my phrasing is sped up, some of it's slow, but it always hovers around this click track okay so I did play along with the click track this is giving me in my ear it's giving me a metronome that's counting out quarter notes for me what that allows me to do is I can kind of play around that click track make sure my downbeats are as close to being on as they can be but as you can see as I zoom in here let me get rid of some of these layers if I zoom in here this wave that we're looking at this is an indicator of how close I'm on or off the grid. Okay, so if this thing were perfect, you see where this is basically similar to where my finger strikes. If I quantize this, this whole thing is gonna shift right to where this line is. As it is, that's very close and I'm proud of myself for being close. Let's go to five, okay? So on the fifth measure in the first beat, I'm a, I'm a little bit early again. Especially when I do these chords. Okay, this is verse one where I've got these chords chopping. You can see that when I hit when I hit the chord, 
that's where this big wave starts to develop. Okay, so this is this is where I hit the key. This is what the microphone picked up of the strings responding to that hit. So as you can see, the hit happens here, the beat is right here. It's a little off, but it's not terrible. This one's very far off, okay? I say very far, it's, again, I'm zooming in pretty far. But if you look at all my beats, they're not, they're not right on the beat. This one's way, way early. This third beat's early. I don't want to get so far off that I'm more than a quarter note for sure, but you kind of hover around. You'll see a um, transition point right here. Basically, this take was doing really good. I thought this was the best I'm going to get it. Up until we went into this chorus, it was really this instrumental section that had been added. I added a transition set of chords that you'll hear going into the instrumental and basically hadn't practiced it enough. So when it the take was going so well, I knew that instrumental was coming up and I started to second guess what chords I was planning on going to. So kind of fluffed them there, but I kept playing. And then at the end here, when I went to end the song, I didn't like the way that I basically missed a note. So I ended up using this take, this yellow section here. This is actually measures that came from one of my previous takes with the lawnmower, I believe. What I like about it is the first take I did, where it was going all the way through, it, it messed up. I messed up. And I ended the song like this. I exaggerate that, but the C, I wanted to end on a, a C. Make sure the C comes out really good. Well, what happened was I ended up hitting the E and the G harder than the C was. So I went back to a take that had a nice. At the end. All right, now that I've talked that thing to death, what I want to do is I'm going to unmute Lana's scratch vocal. So you got some context of how the song's progressing. And I want to play this thing from the beginning and take a listen. Here's where we're at.
sun against a clear blue sky Been a while since I'd seen my daddy cry Eighteen years when I gave him my life On a Sunday afternoon All right. What I really like about this real piano with the upright recording is just the amount of dynamic range that we're able to get from playing keys that are causing hammers to strike strings. So if I try to play, if I try to mimic this with the virtual piano, especially when I go to verse four, Four. Then one summer day he found my hand. He said, Baby girl, I've got a plan. In yeah, so let's see. So this Casio keyboard, it has built in velocities the nicer keyboards that you get they basically have recorded samples of notes that uh, if i play this key as light as i can possibly play it and then i'm going to hit it a little bit harder each time okay i've kind of maxed out by the my fourth or fifth velocity but let's just compare so again i'm going to play this on the Casio keyboard and I'm immediately going to hit play on the upright piano that I recorded and let's hear the difference. And it's not a matter of the honestly the the frequency spectrum the low the amount of lows and the amount of highs there's going to be more frequency content coming from this casio keyboard because you're able to hear each of those notes as if there was a microphone directly on that string as clear as it can possibly be you don't have to worry about the ambience of the room that you're in many many benefits of this what I'm interested in with this song especially is that I knew when I put up microphones on this upright piano, it's not perfectly in tune. You're going to hear some tackiness, like tacky, like the, the hammers hitting the strings. You're going to hear that movement. You're going to hear stuff from the foot pedal. Uh, you're going to hear the stuff in the room that just carries over. So normally if I let go of this key, I let go the the release of this the release time it's so it to me it sounds so perfect because it it just perfectly fades out whereas on this piano going from chord to chord there's this nice overlap of it almost sounds like it's wrong but it's relatable because if you've ever been in like a nursing home or a church or you've heard somebody play a piano live and it wasn't something that was like a Steinway or 
something in a big auditorium concert, you've heard imperfections. And I think that, especially with ballads and things, if we associate those imperfections on the piano, that can influence the rest of the song as well. So take a listen to this. There are these overtones. It's like a, when I say overtones, I'm meaning like, even though I'm hitting these chords here near the end, what I'm actually hearing, this string, there, there are sympathetic, I believe it's sympathetic vibrations happening on the upright piano that when the hammer strikes that string, the vibrations of hitting that string ripple throughout all of the keys. And I think that's what I like most about what I'm hearing. But you can also hear just the mistakes on the piano where I'm not right on the beat. Let's listen to chorus one. I'm gonna turn on the click track here. Right, that's where I'm playing with the time. So I can assure you as bad of a piano player as I am, as I'm playing, I'm not trying to be right on the click track. This can be, it's confusing for me trying to explain what I'm feeling at this, but listen to how on this chorus, when we start to get to the end of the chorus where I know Lana is not going to be singing. I kind of exaggerate a lot of the timing. So here we go. Still on. The, still on the click. All that stuff. stuff what we have now in total we have a scratch vocal we have an arrangement and now we have what I'm calling the real piano so we've recorded the piano none of this stuff I just want to note this if you look at this track those of you that use studio one or pro tools or anything like that we've not done any mixing okay this fader right here is set to zero this vocal track is set to zero. I don't have any EQ, no compression, no reverb, no delay. For something that hasn't been mixed, we haven't EQ'd it. We haven't tried to correct anything. It's sounding really good, liking where we're at so far. Okay, so I hope you enjoy that. This has been a very long video. These will continue to be pretty long, but uh, again, leave a comment if you made it all the way through. Please hit subscribe, like, share this with your friends, and don't forget to connect with me over the different social media platforms. We've got Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter all linked on the page as well. You'll see some posts from me each day during the week. Check back in for next week's episode. We've got some drum recording to be doing, but that's it for episode two of this season, going through the song Sunday Afternoon from beginning to end. Hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next Friday at 3 p.m. Thanks. Hey, are my eyes jumping? If yes, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. But either way, check back with us next Friday at 3 p.m. for some more content and videos. Thank you so much for watching. See ya.